You know, one of the things that I've discovered in my, well, quite frankly, in my life, one of the things that I learned pretty early on as a Christian was that life isn't always what you think it will be. It doesn't always work out the way you think it will. As a matter of fact, more often than not, things happen that <laughs> you couldn't have told were going to happen from the beginning all the way through the end. And boy, wasn't that a surprise. And the more that I've learned about this thing we call life, and the older I get as a born-again Christian, Jesus Gypsy, as a person who's been around the block, so to speak, who's been up the creek and over the hill, well, I discover there are certain things that all of us go through in common. One of them is sin. <laughs> I bet you didn't see that coming. Uh, some of the other ones are ministry, getting old, having hair grow on your nose. Ow! <laughs> You never know what Michael might say, do you? <laughs> oh, well, that's just the way life is. You never see it coming. But one thing that's true about life is that you're going to live it <laughs> until you die from it. Because sooner or later you will die. That's a given. So you might as well live it one way or the other. And the funny thing about life is that you don't have to live it miserable. I mean... Frankly, if you want to be miserable, not only can you, you probably are miserable. You probably have gone through something that made you think that, oh, it'll never change. Please, get a grip on it. I mean, if you're one of those people that think that, oh, this is all there is and it's never going to change, Can you at least sleep on it for 24 hours? Trust me, it'll change. <laughs> or maybe you're one of those people that think, oh man, you know, I have to have it now or else I give up on it. Well, I got a good word for you. Give up on it. See where that gets you. Because you see, life was meant to be lived. It's not a question of whether you're going to live or not, because your body is going to live. In fact, one of the biggest shocks you're going to run into is that you're going to live forever. No! With this nose? Well, maybe not with this nose, but you are going to live forever. So. If I could give you a word on life in general, live it. Oh, I'm not saying go out and party. That's not living. That's doing what you want to do when you want to do it. That's just getting, you think, happiness for a few hours until you get a hangover or whatever it is that you're partying with. But the idea of living life is enjoying the fullness that there is in creation that God intended for you to have. You see, being a Christian is part of that. It's being aware of the fullness that you were supposed to be. See, you're only a, uh, if you're not a Christian, you're only a soul and a, a, a flesh, you know. And you're just uh, kind of like a zombie wandering around, you know. You're half dead and half alive. You're really not living life. You're just kind of Feed me, give me food, give me sex, give me sustenance, give me what I want. It's just zombie life, you know what I mean? Really not much good for anything, <laughs> except to just keep taking, and you have nothing to give, really. But if you want to live, you know, eternally, like in the universe, and experience all that God has in creation and be able to see 
the sensitivity that there is in the things that he's created, in the intricacies of the plant life, in all these things behind me, how they do have a sensitivity and some type of emote that rejoices in God, that can reach out to God and God can reach out to them and they can, creation somehow has a connection of some type with God. Wow, that's living. What if, what if the curse were removed and we could talk to the animals? We could do Dr. Doolittle. But what if we could experience the emotion or the sensitivity of the plant life? What if there is something to creation that God wants to give to us, but because we would probably make gods out of it, we he can't let us have too much knowledge because you know we would try to set up a tree, you know, and worship it, or set up a rock, you know, and bow down to it, or set up, you know, our own people, you know, in front of crowds, you know, and bow down and worship them. Oh, wait a minute, I think we already do that, don't we? <laughs> we call it American Idol, or we worship our worship leaders. Oh, boy. But what is living all about if God took the curse off our brain and we used all the capacity that our physical body had, and then added to it his spirit coming into us, and then we experience the entire completeness of living. Huh. I think that'd be pretty cool. So you see, living, really, is going to happen. One way or another, you're going to step out of this physical world and discover there's a spiritual one. You're going to change the dimension that you're living in right now, and all of a sudden, bingo, step out of this body that will go back to dirt. <laughs> Frankly, you came from dirt and you're going back to dirt. At least your body is. But then you're going to go to a place where, well, let's just say that God's there and whether you like it or not, he's going to decide where you're going to spend the rest of your eternity. You're either going to go over there or over here. And if you go over there, I don't think it's so good. Because God said that, you know, I gave life that it might be reflective of who I am so I could enjoy fellowship with that which I created. I could participate in all that I made so I would have communion with it, that I would be connected to it, that there would be a bond between who I am, which is holy and loving and peaceful and joyful, and my creation, which would be holy and loving and peaceful and joyful. But corruption came in, and when it did, well, I, you know, I had to make a place for it because I can't tolerate corruption. I have to set it aside or it'll ruin everything. Now, obviously we don't know why. We're told, you know, that this angel, you know, kind of went, you know, did a high dive, you know, and thought he was Mr. Hottie Toddy, you know, and thought he was like really cool. So maybe he got jealous over the whole idea that mankind would become God kind because God kind wanted mankind to become like him so that they would grow up to be sons and daughters of God. And angel kind said, ah, we don't like that kind. So it kind of pissed him off, you know, because he said, hey, you know, I've been here all this time worshiping you and doing my thing and covering you. And you know what? I don't think so. You're a loving God. And I think that there's something better than love. I think there's something greater than peace. I think there's more to living than joy. And so in eternity, I think, I think his angel kind of got his, you know, head screwed on backwards and says that evil was found in his heart, you know, and, ugh, you know, he decided that he would become God because he said, hey, I can do what God can do. 
And he tried. You know, and Lucifer, man, you know, I mean, he had a plan, you know. It was short-sighted, because however long it took, in eternity, he didn't see the end from the beginning, and he didn't see the beginning from the end, because the end result was that when he decided that he was smarter than God, when he decided that he knew more than God, when he decided that because God was patient, because God was loving, that God was forgiving, then maybe he could get away with it at some point in time. Because the angels really don't have all up here like they think they do. They only examine things watching us to see how we are going to be dealt with. So they're kind of like, you know, studying, you know, and learning things as they go along because they're not God. So this angel, you know, this this covering angel, Lucifer, he kind of he kind of blew it, you know. He he thought he was so smart. He proved how stupid he was to go up against God. So God said, Hey, you know, I've got a plan. And so, you know, you are not allowed to exist where I am. You may come and present yourself to me in my throne room, but you may not be where I am. And so God separated himself from, sadly, even his angel. And I'm sure that that bothered God. But God had a plan that he was going to create this place that would be completely separate. So eventually he could put away everything that was corrupted by this angel, Lucifer, who had gotten so kind of like screwed up in his thinking that, you know, he had stinking thinking and decided that he was going to, you know, be like, ooh, God, yeah, right, come on, <laughs> sure you are. <laughs> and we all know how that's going to end. But uh, he, he said, you know what, I'm going to dissolve the nature that you're made out of. But because you are eternal, you will suffer eternally for it. And then God said, be out of heaven. And so Satan, you know, as we know, kind of did his number in the garden and kind of screwed things up and tried to ruin God's plan of creation and fellowship and communion with his created beings, meaning you and me. And Satan tried to mess that up, you know, and Somehow it didn't work because eventually, you know, as you know, Jesus came and restored fellowship with God. But in order to live that life, we had to receive that life. We had to participate with God in what he said would change our, our nature, so to speak. You know, the very fact that you know, we were born of flesh so that we could be born of spirit so we could come to know God and come to live life fully, completely, eternally. And in doing so, it's kind of interesting because he's he said, look, I have a plan that's not only going to show what I am and who I am, but I have a plan that's going to reveal to my angels who rebelled and those who didn't rebel, what love really is, because I am love. And so all the angels are kind of like, you know, checking this out, you know, and waiting and wondering, you know, what, what's God going to do? You know, and so there was all these different ways in which God kept trying to show, you know, that he was love to the children of Israel and to, you know, the people of the book and to Abraham and to, you know, Adam and always had, you know, look, you know, even though you're doing this, and doing this, and doing this, and you're kind of going off on these tangents, I'm going to reveal to you how love really does work. And so eventually it came to the point where God had demonstrated his love in so many ways that the only thing that man got out of it was God is wrath, and God is holy, and God is righteous, and you know, we can't even get close to him. And yet at the same time, there were those who seemed to know that God was also fellowshipping with man. Moses went on the mountaintop. Abraham talked to God. 
David was a man after own heart, even though he sinned. There seemed to be this kind of contradiction between God's judgment and God's love. And the world couldn't understand God about his love, so they chose to believe that he was like the God of wrath, the God of judgment, and that he's going to, you know, eliminate and kill people. So God said, look, you know, you're just not getting the picture. You, you kind of got stinking thinking. You're screwing it up. You, you, you don't understand. I am tender. I am merciful. I am loving. I want to extend my grace to you. So since you don't understand the plan, let me send my son. So maybe you get the picture. And Jesus came to explain the Father to us and to explain about life and living life completely and fully. And so he stands on a mountaintop and tells everyone, you know, how life really is. And people say, oh, you know, that's a good idea, but we can't do it. That's a, that's too out there. That's too ridiculously radical, you know, to love your enemies. I mean, come on, Jesus, let's get real. You know, turn the other cheek? I mean, I don't think so. You know, where did you grow up? You know, um, lay down your life? You know, come on now. We only have one life to live. You know, let's get real, God. And so they really didn't accept his message, you know. And to this day, I think people really don't accept what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. They always think it's kind of like a novel idea and a good philosophy, but not a practical way to live. So, Jesus said, if you do these things, here's how it works. Your house is built upon a rock. If you don't do these things, it's built upon sand. Kind of. You decide. You can believe me or not. Take it or leave it. And so in your life, you can take what Jesus said as real and live it. Because you're going to live it one way or the other. It's not going to be always miserable, and it's not going to always be sad. It's not always going to be joy, joy. But it's not always going to be misery, misery. But either way, you're going to live it. You know, you may go out and try to hide from living by you know, shooting up drugs or taking something to make you feel better, you know, some sugar rush or some spiritual rush or whatever. Put music in your head so you can kind of control that thinking process, you know. Or you could do what God said. Seek Him. Live with Him. Fellowship with Him. Have communion with Him. Talk to Him. Because you're going to. In eternity, you're going to stand before God. And decide where you're going to go. And if you've been seeking God in this life, you're going to go to heaven. You're going to get blessed. God's going to say, I love you, so I want you to experience what I've created in the fullness of how I created it. And he's going to give you the universe to explore, to enjoy. And he's going to say, this is an age of your learning about me, of your learning who I am, of what I am, of how I love you. And God's going to give you a new heaven and a new earth, a new age to not reincarnate. <laughs> That's so stupid. That's just somebody making something up. Or to ascend and transcend and become gods. Oh, that's just another person making something up because they want to be God. You know? No. God said, look, I want to bless you with life. I want you to live fully, completely, eternally. That's the way it basically works. I mean, you can live eternally with him, or you'll live eternally without him. And the only place that's without him is in Lake of Fire. God said, you know, I'm only going to put corruption there, so you don't have to go there. If you're not corrupted, I won't put you there. But if you're corrupted, if you don't get vaccinated, you know, if you don't get cleaned up, if you don't straighten out, you know, with my grace, my mercy my love, then I can't put you in with grace and mercy and love and peace and joy because you don't want it. You want violence. You want righteousness. You want holiness. And you want 
all this stuff that unfortunately you're thinking about what it is has been corrupted because that's not what really righteousness is. Righteousness is accepting my love, my mercy, my forgiveness. So I'm going to have to put you over here where you were never intended to go. But I would rather you choose to go the way I intended you to be with me forever. Think of me as a friend, but realize too the wonder of that friendship. As soon as man gives me not only worship and honor, obedience and allegiance, but loving understanding, then he becomes my friend, even as I am his. What I can do for you, yes, but also what we can do for each other. What you can do for me. Your service becomes so different when you feel I count on you and your great friendship to do this or that for me. Dwell more and dwell much on this thought of you as my friends and the sweetness of knowing me and where I can turn for love, for understanding, and for help so that you would know that I am your understanding, I am your love, and I am your help. If you realize that I created you to be with me, that the love I have for you is waiting on you. Then we, you and I, can become friends. That I as God can have friendship with you as my created son or daughter. But if you reject me, then you must go to a place where only the rejected were never meant to be, but have to be. Because though I love you, and though I created all these things for you to enjoy, should you decide to not be with me, then throughout eternity, you will be in hell, and hell will be in that lake of fire.